Since the 1920s, roller coasters have become a staple of amusement park culture. Rarely do you meet someone who isn't brave enough to try at least one theme park ride and experience the rush of adrenaline it provides. Since its boom in popularity, roller coaster designers have scrambled to make every model taller, longer, and faster than the last. However, with each roller coaster getting wilder than the last, so have fears grown around their safety. Of course, we all know these fears aren't baseless. Time and time again, we've seen companies cut repair costs of these roller coasters, ignore early infrastructural warning signs, and refuse to put proper safety measures in place. Many have died on what was supposed to be a good day, and many more have been left with physical and mental scars due to the gross negligence of park authorities. Everyone has a reason to be scared of metal death traps taking them miles off the ground, and it was for fear of his safety that 13-year-old Eamon McIntyre jumped off a roller coaster on September 3rd, 1999. So what exactly went down on that fateful day? What had made the young man so scared that he risked his life to escape it? And what events occurred in the aftermath to solve it? The 2nd of September, 1999 in Doswell, Virginia was a cool Thursday, the same as every other fall day in the area. The leaves were already turning bright orange, the smell of fall-themed snacks was in the air, and citizens were getting themselves into sweaters for the chilling weather. For four young boys, Eamon McIntyre, 14-year-old Mike Crutchman, 13-year-old Adam Edwards, and his brother, 14-year-old Brandon Edwards, it was just another Thursday evening. Instead of spending the time at home, the boys wanted to take the opportunity to visit King's Dominion, formerly Paramount's King's Dominion, an amusement park in the area. Spanning about 280 acres with 13 roller coasters and two water rides, King's Dominion had become a staple in the area, drawing well over 48 million people since its opening in May 1975. In 1999, the park was the place to be if you were looking for family fun and relaxation, and the boys knew this. They were excited to visit the park and couldn't wait to start getting on the rides. One ride the boys were particularly keen on entering that evening was Shockwave. Opened on the 23rd of March, 1986, Shockwave was a famous stand-up roller coaster located in the Candy Apple Grove section of the park, an apple-themed area that was and still is the largest section in King's Dominion. The ride was designed and built by Togo, a Japanese company, and it was the third stand-up roller coaster installation in their history. Shockwave featured two trains with six cars. Riders were arranged two across in two rows for a total of 24 riders per train, and as the name implies, it did not have any actual seats like a regular roller coaster. Instead, the people stayed standing the whole time and were held in place by a harness like a lap bar or an over-the-shoulder strap. Shockwave had a double restraint system with a shoulder harness and a waist level guard to hold riders in place while they were standing. The harness system was to restrain and support the rider, so anything going wrong with it indeed spelled doom for the passengers. However, Eamon was no stranger to Shockwave. He had visited the park multiple times, and that evening alone he, Mike, and Adam had gotten on the ride four consecutive times. Brandon had just joined them, and they were about to go on it for the fifth time, when something began to feel off to Eamon. He was suddenly uneasy. A certain discomfort that hadn't been there before now leadened his bones. His friends had not yet noticed his unease, and Eamon wasn't exactly sure what it was. He chalked it up to nausea. After all, Shockwave did move at speeds of about 80 kilometers an hour, and claimed a height of 95 feet, and he'd just ridden it four consecutive times. He was bound to get sick. However, he wasn't about to chicken out in front of his friends, and he was bound to take one last ride with them. At around 6.30 p.m., Eamon and his three friends were strapped into their places, and that's when he realized what exactly was wrong. Even though nothing went wrong during their first four trips, and he was in a seat that either he or his friends had been in before, Eamon suddenly realized that there was something wrong with the harness. Before he could speak up about it, a ride operator came around for a standard check on passenger safety. The inspection made him breathe a little more easily. After all, a professional could tell if something was wrong. He remained in place as the ride operator pulled lightly on his shoulder harness to check it. The adult seemed satisfied that Eamon was secured, so he believed he was fine. However, when the automatic locks clicked into place, signifying the beginning of the ride, the boy realized he had not been securely fastened. Only two weeks earlier, a death had occurred on the roller coaster. Timothy Fan, a 20-year-old man, was thrown from the train's final turn at a speed of 64 kilometers an hour, 
sustaining a fatal head injury when he struck a steel walkway. The accident had made national news, and Eamon had undoubtedly heard of it. Shockwave had been shut down for investigations afterward, but it was reopened only three days later, when it came to light that the ride was in proper working condition. Timothy Fan had stubbornly refused to obey safety instructions, and had somehow managed to free himself from the ride, resulting in his death. That didn't stop Eamon from being afraid, though. Just that year alone, there had been six roller coaster related deaths. Coupled with the one that happened on the very same roller coaster he was riding, Eamon wasn't about to take any chances. So, when the safety locks clicked in, and he realized he wasn't correctly strapped to his seat, he began to scream. It's not locked. It's not locked. Eamon's friends heard him, and so did some of the other passengers. They took up his cry, but they were too late. The ride was already moving, and they could not gain the attention of the rod's operators from their places. It was a woman walking past that heard their shouting and hurried to tell the operator. Help came to Eamon almost immediately, and the operator instructed him to stay put while somebody signaled the chief operator to stop the ride. But with the death tolls stuck in his mind and his own unease about the ride, Eamon wasn't about to be a victim. Ignoring the operator's instructions, he slipped under his waist-level restraint and jumped from the car as it made its way up the coaster's first incline, about 30 feet above the ground. He landed on a catwalk, twisting his knee, but the adrenaline pumping through his veins kept him moving. The boy walked downstairs with his leg hurt, where one of the ride's surprised operators met him. Almost immediately, Shockwave was stopped, and Mike Crutchman and the Edwards brothers immediately asked to get off. They were so shaken by the events unfolding before their eyes that they didn't want to be on the roller coaster again. The ride's operators assured them that the coaster was safe and they were not allowed to disembark even though they wanted to. While park paramedics attended to a thoroughly shaken and injured Eamon, the ride continued. In the end, one of the operators gave the boys passes for a free trip on the coaster. They did not use them. Afterward, they weren't detained or asked any questions, and a few minutes later, the boys met up with some of their parents and recounted the incident. It was only then that the parents reported it to park officials. So, was Enan's harness genuinely problematic? Was the ride in poor condition? And was there actual evidence to cause him to fear for his life? In the aftermath of the incident, park officials inspected the ride, and it was found that there was nothing wrong with it. Every harness mechanism was in proper shape. The safety locks worked as intended, and there was no indication of a mechanical failure or tampering. Brian Gentilini, a supervisor in the Hanover County Building Inspector's Office, and the man who inspected the ride after the death of Timothy Fan stated that since the ride was in proper working order, there was no case. Susan Lomax, a spokeswoman for King's Dominion, stated that in light of the recent amusement park deaths, Eamon must have felt too afraid to truly relax on the ride and that his restless thoughts influenced his perception of the ride. Nothing was actually wrong, he just felt that something was, compelling him to act before anything could be done, leading to injury and stress for himself. Although this seemed to be the case, Eamon McIntyre's father disagreed. According to him, the only safety device that worked on that whole ride was when his son jumped off it, and King's Dominion was in denial over the entire incident. He said, They don't think their machine can fail. If it happened now, it could happen again. But despite everyone's concern, no other incident ever occurred on Shockwave. With its decreasing popularity and the closure of Togo's American offices, King's Dominion finally announced on July 9th, 2015, that the roller coaster would permanently close. After operating for nearly 30 years and accommodating over 22 million riders, demolition began in November 2015, and it was replaced by Delirium, a giant frisbee roller coaster, in 2016. But what do you think? Please share your thoughts with us in the comment area below. Don't forget to give the video a like and subscribe to our channel for more infamous accidents. If you enjoyed this video as much as I did, make sure you check out this next one.